There's an additional issue with pornography, which is not often discussed, which is that, remember, guys in particular, the brain is a learning prediction machine. And if, I'm not trying to say that all pornography is bad, but there are good data to support the idea that if your brain learns to be aroused by watching other people have sex, it is not necessarily gonna carry over to the ability to get aroused when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody else, right? The, it, especially young kids who are consuming a lot of pornography, the brain is learning sexual arousal to other people having sex. So you're sex. gonna program yourself into being a voyeur. Or, yeah, or just create challenges in, in sexual interactions with, uh, you know, with, with peers, uh, with, a, with a real partner. We all know that society frowns at pornography as being morally unacceptable, but aside from the moral aspect of watching pornography, are there side effects to the brain? Yes. As Huberman mentioned, excessive consumption of pornography can lead to negative outcomes, particularly regarding the brain's ability to learn and predict arousal. When individuals watch pornography, they are essentially training their brains to associate sexual arousal with watching other people have sex, rather than real-life sexual interactions with a partner. This is known as voyeurism. This can create challenges in real life, like sexual interactions, where the focus should be building intimacy and connection with the partner. Therefore, it is essential to educate individuals about the potential risks of excessive pornography consumption and promote healthy sexual behaviors that prioritize building intimacy and connection with the partner. This can help individuals develop healthy sexual habits and promote positive sexual experiences, leading to a happier and healthier life. Let's hear from a neuroscientist's perspective about the hormonal changes in the brain in response to the consumption of pornography. We have to take a step back and now knowing what we know about testosterone and dopamine and all these things and, and ask, you know, what it, what is pornography doing to the brain? Well, first of all, it's triggering the release of dopamine and in the short term testosterone by the observation of sex not actually engaging in human contact. So think about the young brain being significantly more plastic and willing to rewire than the adult brain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, there's no question about it. It's hyperplastic. Yeah. And of course it can wire, rewire again, but you think about somebody who engages in a lot of porn watching, right? Watching porn, and that person is getting dopamine and testosterone increases by observing sex and not actually by engaging in human contact. So that's concerning, right? And there, and obviously the um, people vary, but it should come as no surprise that a lot of these people have trouble with um, romantic interactions when they do happen, right? Because they their brain isn't conditioned to respond to those, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And there's variation there, I'm sure. And, and these are private matters, so there aren't good data because there aren't laboratory experiments that you could do on this sort of thing that uh, someone will probably <laughs> do those experiments eventually. But, but also dopamine seeking is what triggers the increase in testosterone, but as we just talked about it, with repeated dopamine seeking or triggering of dopamine release, it starts getting diminished, diminished, diminished. So pretty yeah. soon that behavior is not causing the release of testosterone. Now people are just doing it compulsively to try and get some little droplet of dopamine out of their out of their brain. Mm -hmm. The human brain is wired to seek pleasure and reward. And one of the ways it does this is by releasing dopamine a neurotransmitter associated with pleasure and motivation. When we engage in rewarding activities, such as eating tasty food or watching pornography, our brain releases dopamine, which makes us feel good and reinforces the behavior. However, when we engage in activities that provide an extreme or intense reward, such as consuming highly palatable foods, our brain releases an even larger amount of dopamine which can lead to a spike in pleasure and motivation. This is also the same when individuals consume pornography. The brain's reward system is activated, releasing dopamine and other chemicals that create a pleasurable sensation. Over time, the brain becomes conditioned to expect this reward in response to watching pornography, and individuals may develop a dependence on pornography to achieve sexual satisfaction. Well, this may seem good, the problem is that when we engage in these extreme activities too often, our brain becomes desensitized to dopamine release. But does desensitization affect the brain and body in general? The other thing that's happening, I should just mention, is that I've got colleagues that work on this in psychiatry, that, that they are wiring their nervous systems to become aroused viewing other people having sex as opposed to them having it. And so they're running into a lot of trouble there. So. You, what, what's happening Super is that dopamine levels are so high that real life circuit, it's like, it's like eating extremely palatable foods that are just blitzing your system, every taste bud, high salt, high sugar, high fat to the point where it's just, and let's assume delicious. I don't generally like those kinds of foods, but, and then all of a sudden it's like, here's a bowl of rice or a, or a salad. It's going to taste like garbage to you because you're at first anyway. So look, it's, it's unlikely to be an all or none. 
um, I think, uh, and I don't know what the line is, but we just have to be careful. Anytime we are overwhelmed with powerful images of increasing intensity, that's where you start getting into the dopamine depletion. Mm. That's where you start getting into the hormone depletion that, that, we're, that we're talking about here. So this is also true of violence. A lot of people, they're like excited about watching zombie apocalypse violence, plus all of that violent sex and everything getting poured into the same film. Well, they made horror movies, you know, 50 years ago. They were a little bit different. The question is how strong were we driving the system? And if anyone out there is feeling underwhelmed and kind of like life is no good, et cetera, chances are your dopamine system has been pushed too hard. I'll give one quick anecdote of a friend. One of the potential effects of exposure to pornography is desensitization to sexual stimuli. This means that over time, individuals may require more extreme or novel forms of pornography to achieve the same level of arousal that they once experienced with more moderate forms of pornography or sexual activity. Research has shown that this desensitization can occur in men and women who view pornography frequently. Studies have found that individuals who view pornography regularly rate sexual images as less arousing and exciting over time than those who do not view pornography. This desensitization may be due to a phenomenon known as habituation where repeated exposure to a stimulus leads to a decreased responsiveness to that stimulus. In the case of pornography, repeated exposure to sexual images and scenarios may lead to decreased arousal and interest over time. Additionally, the prevalence of more extreme forms of pornography, such as violent or degrading pornography, is associated with greater desensitization. This may be because these types of pornography require more intense and extreme stimuli to achieve the same level of arousal. The consequences of desensitization to sexual stimuli can include decreased satisfaction with sexual experiences in real life, difficulty with arousal, and an increased risk of developing problematic or addictive behaviors related to extreme stimulation of our dopaminergetic system. Now, with pornography, it's a slippery slope, right? There's also a whole aspect of pornography, which is that if people are pursuing pornography and they're not pursuing relationships, there is the potential that they reach their 20s and 30s and they are truly dysfunctional in terms of, look, every species has two major goals, protect the young and make more of itself. Mm -hmm. You know, whether or not you decide to have children or not is a, is a personal issue. I personally don't have children. I may someday, but every species protects its young. The, ma the maternal aggression is amazing, right? A mother protecting its young, there's nothing like it in the animal kingdom. Actually, that's not triggered by testosterone. That's triggered by estrogen, which is interesting. But the parents of every species try and protect the young and they try and make more young. This is, this is why every species is, is driven to do that. Mm -hmm. And you think about what porn and masturbation, these things are, really are. I'm not calling them sinful. What I'm saying is they are potentially addictive, especially with the availability of pornography. So, um, you know, beware, you know, just everyone's different and, and people have to have to be careful about these circuitries. You really need to protect them. They are, they are super valuable. And so I would say in keeping with our theme of, you know, what are the other things to do to support testosterone would be, uh, don't engage. I would avoid pornography. Frankly, I really would. I would, you know, maybe everyone's got their threshold for what's too much for some people that might be the number might be zero. For other people, it might be something different, and it's gonna vary. Our nervous system has a natural rhythm of pursuing things and getting a dopamine boost when we find them. This can be compared to how we need energy to find food, and then we use that food to gain more energy for further pursuits. Humans, like all animals, have innate desires to protect their young and propagate their species, even if they choose not to have children. This drive for reproduction is a fundamental part of our biology and explains what we seek out sexual experience. This mechanism is driven by neurotransmitters like dopamine and epinephrine, which give us the energy and drive to pursue our goals. Just like we need the energy to go out and hunt for food or gather resources, we also need the energy to pursue our goals and ambitions. This is where the dopaminergetic system comes into play. The dopaminergetic system is a critical part of our brain's reward pathway, essential for survival as a species. However, when these behaviors become overstimulated, either through extreme experiences or substances like drugs, it can lead to a cycle of addiction and desensitization. But this natural rhythm of dopamine release and desensitization is okay. It is part of our innate drive to pursue our goals and ambitions, and it has allowed humans to survive and thrive for thousands of years. However, in today's world, where we have easy access to extreme stimuli like pornography and junk food, we need to be mindful of how well we use these stimuli and how they affect our well-being. Adversely, 
This desensitization leads to a need for more extreme versions of the activity to achieve the same level of dopamine release, which can have negative consequences on our physical and mental health. So we have to devise a way to manage excessive dopamine release. But the question is, how? Graduate high school, he went to community college for a little bit, decided not to do that anymore. Then he stopped working, he stopped exercising. He's really fit. He's got like, his genetics are like Nassimas. He's kind of like, he's just got this incredible physique and all this, doesn't do anything. Doesn't work, doesn't do anything. He's a failure to launch, as we call it. And they were analyzing, does he have ADHD? Does he this? And he heard Anna talk about dopamine depletion. And he called me and he said, and he said I'm gonna do one month, no video games, no phone, no nothing. He's 25 days in and he's running again, he's lifting again, he's heading back to work again. And so awesome. this was somebody who thought he had ADHD. Now there are people with ADHD out there, but what happened was he was dopamine depleted. So he couldn't concentrate, he didn't care about anything. And so the phone and just living in this constant stream of movies that are really stimulating on YouTube and everything else, I mean, you have to be, I mean, we're on YouTube right now and I use YouTube for my podcast and everything, but you have to know when to shut that valve. And here's what I tell myself. Shut that valve so that I can continue to enjoy it, right? It's like gorging yourself with tomahawk steaks. They're delicious, but unless you've been fasting all day, you're not going to eat nine of them, right? What's your record, Mark? I think I've done two. Two. But yeah, nine would be, yeah. a, that would be a feat. Yeah, yeah. two, but they were the size of, you know, the table, mm -hmm. but no. Um, so you have, if you want to continue to enjoy things and pursue things, you have to know when to slam the gate shut. And I think that no one told us that we needed to do that. Mm -hmm. That's the challenge. And so just like with training, you get out past 75 minutes, 90 minutes. If you're natural, you're gonna start seeing a depletion in testosterone, get out of the gym, go eat, go recover, <laughs> go go relax, yeah. you know? This is true for ice baths too. In Anna's book, she talks about ice baths. The, the data, I have the data, this is really weird, but I have the data. This is a study that was done by at the University of Prague, published in the um, uni universe, uh, European Journal of Applied Physiology. 250% increase in dopamine and norepinephrine from a three hour ice bath. One way to manage this is through dopamine fasting, where we take breaks from the things that stimulate our dopamine release and allow our brains to reset. This can help us regain sensitivity to these stimuli and prevent us from becoming desensitized or addicted to them. It's important to remember that dopamine fasting is not about deprivation or denying ourselves the things we enjoy, but rather about using them mindfully and intentionally that support our overall well being. By taking breaks from these stimuli and practicing dopamine fasting, we can allow our system to reset and maintain a healthy balance. Our innate drive to pursue things is a key part of our biology, but we must be mindful of how we engage with stimuli that can lead to addiction and negative consequences. Thanks for watching! Did you enjoy this video? Then show your support by subscribing, ringing the bell, and enabling notifications to never miss videos like this. Thank you!